Hello and welcome back to the show. My name is Andrew East and today we have a very exciting interview where we sit down with Michael Ma. Michael is a legendary entrepreneur in my mind and he has come from a diverse background. He started a company called Talkman, which ultimately sold to Google. Then he went to uh, the venture capital space and worked with a firm called Liquid2 Ventures, which was with Joe Montana. He went through the Y Combinator process himself and certainly has learned a lot as a founder, which is why I'm so excited to, to bring this conversation to you as he's started a new company, a new organization called Creator Dow, which is all about the creator economy, whether you create YouTube videos, podcasts, Instagram videos, blogs, whatever it is, this Creator DAO is a mechanism and a tool that you can use to both learn, grow, and mentor the next generation. And so Michael shares his journey of what he's learned as a founder, as well as his personal story, which is amazingly inspiring to me, where he came from China, his parents had $300, and now he's gone on to sell a company to Google. So he has a lot of good things to share. If you want to learn more about Michael, as well as what he's building with Creator DAO, you can click the link down below. And let's go ahead and jump into it with Michael Ma. Michael, I can't believe we're sitting here in person and having this conversation. I know. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Dude, we have been talking for months, and first of all, congratulations. Thank you. It's been a big couple weeks. It has been. I would love to hear, how would you get here? Dude? I feel like I'm, my IQ, just being in the same room as you, <laughs> has escalated. What like where did you grow up? Where did you come from? What did your parents do? I don't know. I don't imagine they were working in the cryptocurrency world back no, then. But no. would love to hear that side of of Michael. Thank you. Um, and and you give me too much credit. You're <laughs> the one teaching me all this stuff. About yeah. Um, I'll start a little bit earlier than I usually do, just to share you know, where I came from. My parents actually came up from China to US with three hundred dollars, so we didn't have a whole lot growing. By the time we were more middle class. I had the most Asian parents who really cared about education, was like, you need to study hard. And they did something that, you know, was a huge sacrifice. We moved to Beverly Hills so I could go to Beverly Hills High School. But, you know, we're far from rich, so lived in a small apartment. My mom slept on one of those pull-out sofa beds for four years for that to happen. And, you know, it paid off. I, I went to Yale and then Harvard Business School. My sister went to Duke, then Harvard Law. So finally made the Asian parents proud. <laughs> wow. But it was always, I mean, it was a sense of immense sacrifice that they made that. And it does go into how I think about a lot about startups, what I'm doing with Creator Down, just my personal journey. It's like, hey, I think everybody should get, be given the opportunity. It's so important. Because that's not what I was getting. It wasn't giving me money. I wasn't having anything else, but I had opportunity. And it draws into a lot of parallels of what we're trying to create that, which is just giving these people opportunity to have a shot to build something really big and become the creator. But going back to, to my story of, you know, a long winded way to get there. I, after Yale became a startup founder, I started coming out talked in, in the business messaging space. I went for a program called Y Combinator that really inspired a lot of the aspects of what, and what we are building with creator Dow which again, gave me an opportunity as somebody who wasn't super connected to have a chance to beat some of the biggest VCs in the world after finishing the program. We eventually grew the company, raised some money, but long story short, we sold the company to Google. I got a chance to work with some of the best product leaders there, folks like Jen Fitzpatrick, Marissa Mayer, uh, Kasia Yunus, and learn a lot about that and I still have this love for startups. So I became Throughout the time there, a Y Combinator startup school TA, I mentored a lot of companies. I then realized, hey, you know, since I'm helping all these startups, what's a good way to establish this? So I helped start a venture capital firm with Joe Montana. And that firm, Liquid2 Ventures, ended up investing in a lot of companies. And within the firm, there was two areas I couldn't get out of my eye. And one was creator economy, companies that care it, restream, whatnot were my investments where I just fell in love with the opportunity set there. The second part was crypto. So I was a Binance Lab mentor. I saw some of the earliest projects, like Solana was still called Loom Protocol, FTX was still called Almeida. Like I was able to see some really interesting things getting built. And eventually I was tired of staying on the sidelines. I mean, investing is one of the best jobs and I could ever have. I'm super grateful for that. But at the same time, it is not the same as building. And I saw crypto as both having such a massive opportunity, but I also saw even 
in the groups I was with, the, a lot of times it was used for not always positive behavior, right? Not always the best choice for environment. And a lot of times what people were doing is they were shilling tokens. We've seen this in a lot of crypto projects that are calling pushing like buy this token, buy that, buy this Inu token or that. And we realized that energy, that community, it was a community too. And it was marketing, it was all these things was better directed towards the creator economy. That you could go out there instead of being like, here's a random, you know, Inu token that may or may not take off. Here's a random DAO token. You could say, hey, here's a creator. I'm supporting via creator DAO. Go watch some of their content. Mm -hmm. You know, that was so much easier to share and so much more impactful for somebody else. A lot of times I saw this in the DeFi space where you would just see, you know, like I was talking about this, but like when you talk about 20% yields, I went to Harvard Business School. I don't make, know how to make 20% yields come out of thin air. It just doesn't happen. Right. Uh, but what does happen is someone like you doing a collab with upcoming creator, they're going to get an audience increased by 20, more than 20%. Like almost every day I talk to creators, I talk, I ask them, hey, have you ever done a collab with somebody? And what happened? And just this morning I was talking to somebody that I've been a fan of, Austin Evans, who was talking me about a collab that he did with an upcoming creator. And their viewers is something like 5 x right? Like that is real value being created and really is the value of collaboration that's happening. So your parents came to the U.S. with $300. Yeah. And then you go through this amazing trajectory of going to not one but two Ivy League schools, uh, selling a company to Google, one of the most valuable companies in the world, um, and then getting access to mentoring and teaching and being around all these founders, which... I would love to talk about what you learned there, but yeah. but f first, what was your approach from you know having your mom sleep on a pull out couch yeah. to to achieving what you have? How have you uh, like what's been your mindset? Because there's kind of like this, I feel like mental leap that you have to make going yeah. from a scarcity mentality, as I say, to yeah. like this yeah. abundance or like. You know, there, there is a bit of courage or uh, just, you know, the world is my oyster approach to life that you that you have to have to do what you've done. So how how did you walk into that? I mean, there's so many parts of it. I think work ethic helps a lot. I like I was inspired by my parents and saw how hard they worked. And so I don't think I'm a genius by any means, but I do think I try to work harder than anybody else around me. I, I saw that and multiple endeavors I've done where I just put a little bit of extra effort, spend that extra time and, and really go into detail. I also think like so many times in my career, having a good mentor has helped. So my mentor for a long time was a guy named Castro Yunus. He was the guy who was CEO of my company, TalkBen, I was CEO when I found on, he ended up starting a $3 billion company, right? Having a guy like that just, you learn so much when you're around really smart people. So I've always tried to surround myself with really smart people. I've always valued hard work. And I do agree, we, we like getting from that mentality of scarcity where you're just like, hey, I just wanna go day to taking that risk, right? Be like, hey, I had a stable job before I started a company. And just to go from, I'm not making anything, watching a bank account dwindle. I do think I've always been like calculated about the kind of risk I take. Right. Even even starting Creator Dow, right? I knew I'd have a great venture career. I was, hey, if if we really want to take things to level uh, next level, starting a company is the only way to really affect change at a, a much more massive level. And so, so I've always been good at like knowing the right risk to take, and I, I'm glad it worked out because it could have not worked out. Well, what's the what's the delineation between a risk that you would take and a risk that you wouldn't? It's really weird, you know. It it is more of an art than a science. Like, I remember when I sat down with my co-founder who was like, hey, quit your job. I had a stable job at Sears Holding for a while, trying to do the turnaround situation there. And he's like, I'm driving down to California, and I'm going to start this company. And he hadn't raised any money. There was nothing there. But when I saw his spark, how he talked about things, and just knew how smart he is, I was willing to take risks. I think sometimes it is knowing, like, who will you be working with? Who's in the trenches with you really matters. 
I'm, I'm, I'm sort of grateful you're in the trenches with me now, <laughs> trying to build this with me, you know, giving me so much valuable advice, which inspires me. It's like, hey, if I can get someone like Andrew willing to spend time with me, I think I'm on the right track, right? Like that's, that's the stuff that kind of like, if you see really smart people going, th that actually was part of the reason I got into crypto. I saw some of the smartest people I knew saying, hey, I'm spending time mm -hmm. in crypto. I say, I'm not smart enough. Let me spend time in crypto. There's a guy who today is famous for running one of the biggest crypto funds in the world. His name is Matt Wong. He runs a firm called Paradigm. He was in the batch with me at Y Combinator. When I suddenly saw him spending all this time in crypto, I was like, this guy's smarter than me. There's a reason why. So let mm -hmm. me take more time to do that. So sometimes knowing where to go to risk is ask yourself, where are the smartest people you know? Where are they going? It, it seems like it's the, the people that you're doing this with as yeah. well as the vision yeah. as you alluded to like can this affect change in the world um i think that i think there's a lot of wisdom in that whereas you know if if it's solely to make as much money as you can or solely to get as much fame as you can i think we've we've both been in this position uh, in way different ways, you having sold the company, me having achieved my childhood dream of like playing football, yeah. Sean with uh, the Olympics, where you get to that surface level goal, yeah. you stand there at the peak and you're like, oh, this is it? Or like, what's next? And so having the purpose to underline that, I think is incredibly powerful. And like, you know, this approach of, I want to, I want to make a difference in the world. It's, it's beautiful. I honestly think I'm so impressed when I think of a, of a, of a business personality that I admire and look up to, you're that. So oh, wow. thank you. <laughs> this is an honor for me. Oh, thank but, you. But, uh, you recently launched creator Dow. Yes. Which is a huge deal. And as a creator myself, I couldn't be more excited, but would love for you to kind of give a brief overview of what this is. And, um, and then we could dig in from there. Yeah. So creator Dow is the first DAO really set up to invest in creators. So when I was a founder, I went through a program called Y Combinator. I'm trying to mirror that in a lot of ways when I started Creator DAO. And there's two parts to that. The first part that's confusing for a lot of people is DAO because that's it's a really <laughs> new term. And what I like to simplify it for is to think of it as a community. And a community that is governed by tokens where the community itself creates the rules and only controls the entity. That, uh, and it's, it's all recorded on a blockchain. Mm -hmm. And the first part of that creator to me means so many different things. You know, th I think what people thought of creators years ago has changed. It's obviously YouTube, but it's Substack, it's podcasts, it's everything that's out there. And more and more, if you take a look at creators, what they feel like today is they feel like individual startups. And so I was a VC in a previous life. And to me, this is the best way for a community to sort of invest together and sort of have a stake in each other's futures. It's so exciting because to your point about creators being startups, when you look at where legacy brands are putting their marketing dollars, when you look at the up and coming brands like Gymshark is a creator-based, social media-based company. And when you look at the growth of the creator economy as a whole. And that encompasses so many things to your point that we're talking like sports contracts, like race car driving, tenant, like all of these things are kind of derivatives of the creator economy now because the exposure, the reach, the community that's built um, is so key. And it's a new thing with social media. So whether you're talking podcasts, video content, newsletters, as you mentioned with Substack, uh, blogs, like the internet's a wild place. Yeah. It's so fun. And it seems like creator DAO is this support mechanism for allowing existing creators who have been doing this, like this first wave to help support and stand up future creators. Do I have that right? Absolutely. That, <laughs> that is the purpose of what we're doing here today. In some ways, I said this when I thought about my venture career, when a founder, you know, has been successful, has done something, but is burned out or doesn't want to be a founder again, what do they become? They become a venture capitalist. Mm -hmm. And for creators who have, you know, at a certain point in time, it gets tiring to keep creating content. There's a limit to that. But there's not really equity value that they've accumulated because the moment they stop cre creating videos, 
that's it. It's, it's gone. So how do they sort of capture that value in some sense and still help the next generation? And that's what the token enables of what we're doing. So it is really a chance for the previous generation to act like a VC, help us find the next generation creators, help us mentor them, do collabs on them, and basically translate that into value for the next generation. That's it gets me so excited. And we you know, we alluded we've been talking about this for months. Yeah. We connected through Jade Sherman, shout out Jade. <laughs> and uh I think w- w- we had a very early conversation before the concept was really tangible. Yeah. You're uh, the one of the first people who <laughs> believe in us. <laughs> I always appreciate that. Well well here's what I believe in um is Sean and I recognize this problem of one as a creator, you you can't make as much content as there's a demand for. Right. Yeah. Two is we went through this whole, we've been doing YouTube for seven years yeah. and have published, I think we're over like 800 videos, maybe 900. Wow. And so the things that we've learned, uh, through that process can help if someone's just about to make their first YouTube video, the lessons that we could bestow on them, or the growth that we could catalyze with them is huge. And when, when Sean and I first started, we made a spreadsheet of all the creators that were derivatives or kind of touched our niche, which was gymnastics at the time, Mm -hmm. found their contact information, reached out. It was all cold outreach, asked for collaborations. Some said yes, most said no, but the collaborations that we did do fueled our growth to get us to the point where we could do this full time. And that's like just the idea of mentorship is so crucial, whether you're talking creator economy Mm -hmm. or any other industry. Um, But I feel like in this world of creators being startups, you're kind of a one man show. There's equipment, there's editing, there's production, there's props, there's all these different things that can be overwhelming Mm -hmm. and really be obstacles to people creating and speaking to this community in the, in the real sense they can, because I, I'm a big believer. So I'm talking so much here, but I love it. <laughs> I'm a big believer that everybody has a unique story and experience they can share, uh, that can connect with a community online. And that concept is, is beautiful, but there needs to be more. I think there needs to be more creators. Um, so this infrastructure that you've established to incentivize, educate, and uh, collaborate creators together is just gets me so pumped. And uh, I'll add (laughs) the part I love about your story is people helped you when you were coming up. And in so many ways, as I've talked to so many creators over the last year, it's shocking how many of them are so similar to startups. I'm like, you sound just like the other startup founder I was talking to in my venture career, right? Like it's lonelier than people think being a founder. Yes, you have tons of employees, but nobody really knows what you're going through. Yeah. And two, like, I can't tell you how many people helped me when I first started building a company. And just using my uh, my personal experience, I went through a program called Y Combinator. It's a famous startup factory. It creates tons of great companies, right? Just helps build community companies like Airbnb, Coinbase, all went through it. And what was so special was as I was trying to do what's called a YC interview to get into YC, a bunch of previous alumni came out to me and said, hey, this is where we can do help you. And they didn't ask for anything. Mm-hmm. Right, but I would think this community would be supercharged if there was something on a blockchain that could reward people with tokens as they helped each other. And that's what we intend to do for Creator Economy, right? All these people who helped, imagine they all have a stake in what you're building, and you have a stake in the future generation and what they're building, right? That's that's the power of what we're, we're trying to get here. Uh, there's probably a, a broader conversation that needs to be ha- had about crypto and, and DAOs. Yeah. Uh, we can get to that. But the I think the difference between the Creator Economy and like the Y Combinator, which is the elite startup incubator. Yeah, it is like the grad school. For it's, it. it's like the Harvard <laughs> school. Of it's insane. But the difference is there's only a handful of, of uh, companies that go through that. Yeah. There's thousands, millions of, I think I read something that there's like, I don't know. It was in the tens of millions of people who consider themselves creators now. Yeah. So to scale that type of mentorship is not something you could like really do without smart contracts, blockchain, crypto. Yeah. That's what's so beautiful about the creator yeah. now. You almost need that. I mean, you need technology. Right. Like, I think it happens blockchain is one of the best to scale this up, but 
what is called technology and it's, it's also community those two things intersections and when we thought of this we weren't like we want to build a crypto company we said we wanted three things we wanted community mm -hmm. technology and capital and we think the best expression of that is a very unique blockchain entity called a DAO. Well, that's how it came together. <laughs> Can you do your best to describe what a DAO is? I will try. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, DAO at simplest is what's known as a decentralized autonomous ent organization. So think of it as a community whose decision making is governed on the blockchain. So by being a token holder, you ultimately control the decisions that the entire entity is making. So take something simple like, who should we be investing? Which creator is going to be up and coming? That is a completely decentralized decision made by all the token members. And the great thing that we think is really special is actually that's exactly what we want to happen, right? There is value add to be had by having hundreds, thousands, some of the millions of people make that decision versus you know the traditional media way somebody who's been around in hollywood for a while who's famous already who's like i'm gonna pick the one person who's gonna be famous now we don't want that we want it to be completely different. and i think the next level of creators will look very differently because the community is going to be picking them and that's what's special it's actually you know i, I should joke around about this but like youtube discovered justin bieber way before somebody you know who specializes in discovery, right. discovering music talent like a scout discovered them right so by giving power to the community just to select these people, also to find these people, is also one of the reasons we chose to use crypto to do this in blockchain. The people you've involved so far, Paris Hilton, Chain Smokers, you have uh, Gary. You. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Most you. Most importantly, Thank you. Andrew. Uh, you have a, an amazing group of creators, plus Sean and I. Uh, <laughs> and then you've also raised money yeah. from some phenomenal institutions like Andreessen Horowitz. Yeah. Um, as well as I'm blanking on initialized initialized capital. Yeah. Um, so it's very exciting and I feel like the future is so bright with this. Yeah. We, you know, we were grateful that a lot of really big investors saw the potential of this. They realized, Hey, we've been investing in founders for so long. There's something going on in the creator economy. We want to back this company because when they talked to us, they realized we were just forward thinking and we were already working with people like you and they're like, just so impressed because we speak the creator's language, right? We were like, it's it's not about us. Like, it never is about creator doubt. It's about all the creators we back. And there's gonna, as we have to say, we'll show that really in everything we do. That in end day, the community comes together to support the creators and that's what makes it so powerful. And even the VCs that we chose specifically, both of the funds that we chose led, the partners there were creators themselves. So Shriram and Andreessen Horowitz has his own YouTube channel. Gary Tan has his own YouTube channel. They came to us as creators. Gary did something that he's never done before in his career, really. He said, I'm going to put a percentage of my earnings from my YouTube channel into the Dow. Just turn over it. Like, you can see, like, as a VC, they're not used to doing that, right? They invest a lot, but they're not used to say, hey, I'm going to put a percentage of earnings I made. So, you know, credit to him for doing something that he's never done before. My old partner, uh, Joe Montana, who I've worked with uh, in a previous life as a venture capitalist, he went and said, hey, I'm not a traditional creator, but I have some cameo earnings. I want to put it into DAO. So th it's, it's really a community coming together more than even the VC dollars that I thought was really special. You know, sometimes I think of it just, if you forget order carpet, it's like, think of it as a club. And there's a way that you have a vote in everything the club does. Yeah. Right. And how how do you ensure that votes fair? How do you ensure that votes tracked through tokens? And so that's why we do that. And this club can be set up to do n any number of things. It can be an investment club. It could be a club to vote on something. It could, you know, be a club to buy NFTs. It could be used for a variety of things, but it is ultimately decided by the people. And the great thing is some of the aspects that make crypto so special are automatically in ours. This trustless nature, this thing that like everything's recorded on a blockchain and immutable. That's really special, right? It, it's super public that, hey, this is what, how everybody voted, right? And you can't fix it in any way. You can't, like, it's not, like, fix it in an election side of way. It's like, ah, right. well, well, like, it goes in this black box. You don't have, it's like, hey, there's a clear public record of what happened. And DAOs break down if they don't ever answer to that, right? Yeah. If, if there ever comes a time where, you know, somebody's like, hey, the DAO didn't listen to it. It'd be clearly on the public. Like, we all voted for this to happen, and it didn't happen. That, that doesn't work. Suddenly the doubt breaks down. And 
a lot of votes, sometimes there's obfuscation of exactly what happened, who voted for what, or exactly what, this is all clearly recorded on blockchain. And this blockchain, it, you know, is designed to withstand almost anything, right? Like, this, think about, like, the internet, what made it, it was de designed to withstand a nuclear attack, right? This is designed to be a mutable record of how a community voted, and you get an entire record of the entire history of that. And well, that will be stored till the end of days, right? <laughs> as long as the internet exists, and as long as one node exists, there'll be a track record of what this community came, how they made that decision. And the great thing is it keep it can keep getting smarter, right? That's the beauty of smart contracts, the beauty of programming and software that it's just not like, in some ways, like something that's set in stone, the community makes it better over time. It's so exciting to think that you can have a creator who's taught by creators, who collaborates with other creators, and who is chosen by the community itself. Yeah. Like that is, I feel like so many of the things needed to be a successful creator on the internet. It's amazing. Yeah. And the cool thing is, I think, if you're responsible for a choosing creator, you're gonna be more supportive, right? That just happens naturally. If you feel a sense of ownership, if you sense of like, hey, I'm gonna be able to govern, I'm gonna be able to help the system in some way, you're actually more bought in. So I think the fans and the down members will be more engaged than the typical community. And that's what we want to have happen. That's awesome. I would like to provide the context for the landscape yeah. of, of, again, we've been full-time creators for seven years and to see wow. the evolution of, of how things have grown and, and yeah. changed uh, has been really pretty awesome. Scary at times, but oh, awesome. Sure. Um, but when Sean and I first started making videos and yeah. publishing, it was in this time where these multi-channel networks, these MCNs yeah. were rampant. And so the concept is these MCNs kind of acted as an agency to some degree where you'd sign on, There'd be this collective of other channels who may or may not uh, have the same value set or, or like niche as you. Uh, they kind of sold you on this idea of collaboration and then they w might be able to earn you more money through premium AdSense and maybe some deals. That kind of fell apart um, to a large degree. Yep. And looking back, I, I think it was successful. There was a brief yeah. moment in time where it was like, okay, when, it, when it's a focused MP MCN, and they're fulfilling that mission of like, of catalyzing collaborations, getting creators together, making videos that worked. But then it turned into this game of how many channels can we sign? Mm -hmm. So you had people like full screen who had tens of yeah. thousands of channels, right? Um, and then from that, this, the, the idea of collaborations was uh, retained, but that whole mass collaboration fell apart. And so you had these collab groups like Vlog Squad, Team 10, Hype House. We're still kind of seeing a lot of these where it's a group of creators yep. who are making content together, featuring each other in their content. And the growth is explosive, like undeniably. Yep. You look at everybody associated in those groups, that's worked. And so the through line is the collaboration. Um, and that's what is exciting about this web 3.0 of the internet where it maintains that it preserves that to a large degree. But yeah, <coughs> I think, uh, especially some YouTubers who came from the generation, it had a pretty negative experience for a variety of reasons, yeah. but it's core, like that core value proposition has persisted, right? Yeah. Like you said, in the content houses and team 10 and sway house. And we've sort of doubled down on that. Yeah. And, it really is this idea of collaboration and community. And what broke down for a lot of those, it, it almost became this faceless, like behemoth of a holding company. Instead of being about what makes the house so special is the community actually owns it. Yeah. So every member is voted in by the community. Other part is because the community members are putting a little bit of their earnings into this overall system, there's this sense of, hey, we're all in it together, that we want to collaborate with each other. It's a lot different when you work for a giant corporation, they come to you and say, you need to collab with this person. You're like, I don't know this person. I'm already putting some of my earnings in. I'm expecting you to help me, not me to help the system. Manager. Versus, hey, you are an owner, a governor. You decide and you make decisions that an entire DAO follows. And by the way, every single other member of the DAO is in the same position as you. And each person gets reward tokens as they help the community that changes things dramatically when you really do feel like, hey, I'm in control. This community, it's community run program, right? Like yeah. so I say, hey, it's a club. When you think of a club, it's not a corporation, right? A 
corporation is something that tells you what to do is your boss, your manager. A club is something that everybody's in together. And so then it changed the dynamic, right? When you know, hey, I help pick this person, I help mentor a person, now I'd love to do a collab with them, right? You already helped them. And by the way, everybody in the community is putting a percentage of, of their earnings into the, into the Dow Treasury themselves, which is ultimately voted on by the community what to do with that treasury, right? So that's, a, to me, a very different thing than saying, hey, how can I help some Facebook corporation get there and, you know, hit the quarterly profits, go public, get sold? That's just a different objective versus, okay. hey, we as a community own this treasury, so all let's think about ways we can help collaborate, increase this treasury, and help each other in the long run. Yeah. To me, and, and maybe I'll summarize, it's, it's community-owned. That, yeah. That's the big thing. You know, it's, it's run by the community, and that's what makes it unique and special. And you do see that with smaller communities, that they feel like, hey, we are part of this. And the asset that the community is owning is high value. So you look at these deals that Spotify has with buying podcasts, like Team Coco was acquired, I think, for $250 million. Mm -hmm. Joe Rogan was in the hundreds of million and do millions of dollars. Bruce Springsteen sold his archive yeah. and library of music to Sony for $500 million, I think. Yeah. Um, and so there's companies currently in a centralized way, buying these back catalogs that are valuable because you can sell ads against them. You have this video that y it's yeah. like a, it's like Nike getting a, an, that shot of Tiger Woods winning the masters when the ball just rolls into the cup, yeah. like that is invaluable. And so if you think about that type of marketing on a broad scale through the creator economy, that's what the, the community is owning pretty much. Yeah. Like, you know, to, to us, it, it's a couple things, right? This entire system is powered by some fairly sophisticated software. The community actually votes on what happens after, how it gets developed. There's also this community treasury of all the creator earnings going through it, and that's what the community wants. Right? Ultimately, th whatever decisions the community choose to make gets reflected. Yeah. And, and, and again, it, it's on the blockchain, right? So nobody can stop it. it it's very clear how people voted. Um, we're never gonna distribute cash. We don't think that's the right way to do things. And it is this idea of like, we, as founders of this, we don't control ultimately where it goes, right? It is up to community to see how far they can take it, right? And to me, that's, you know, so from some people, they're scared of that. They're like, oh, what happens to the community? But to me, oftentimes, actually, even better decisions get made when 100,000 really smart people uh, come together and say, where should we drive this community forward? To me, it could be an, any number of things. I can imagine someday this becomes sort of a creator guild where they're like, hey, why are these you know, platforms paying us so little? Why don't we come together to change that? And we also have the resources of the shared community to really put dollars behind that and make it serious, right? Which people wouldn't be able to do before. You don't get corporations like that. Corporations have a CEO, maybe there's a couple of board members, but it's not truly run by the community. And that's what we're able to do. And actually, it already when I talk to community members, they're the ones taking it further, right? You're the one coming to me with ideas. I'm like, wow, Andrew, I didn't even think about that. That's what I love about what we're building. And, and again, it, it's not top down driven. It's bottoms up driven by all the community members. Like, hey, what areas should we expand to? Where should we take this treasury and invest in? Which is the next creator? That's what's really cool about what we're doing. Dude, I love it. I love it so <laughs> much. Uh, just the to see the amount of companies... Uh, and concepts being built around the creator mm -hmm. economy. We're having dinner tonight with a, a fintech startup yeah, that's, that's yeah, care that's that's um, centered around the creator economy. There's so many, um, but this gets me so excited because I just think the internet is like the rubber meets the road of when I, as a human, realize that I am able to share a story that affects other people. Um, there's something beautiful captured by that. And, and this unlocks so much of that, but yeah. And I will say like, I've been inspired by the generosity of creators. Like if we had come without our mission, honestly, most of them like, Hey, you know, my time is very expensive. They mm -hmm. wouldn't have joined our program. There's so many creators would say, Hey, I want to speak in front of upcoming creators. I want to do it for free or for like, very little part of this, like I've never seen that happen before. And it just shows like when you have a good mission it inspires other people to join, like really to be like, Hey, like if you came to them as a brand, you're like, do this brand deal for me. And I'm like, Hey, this is my minimum country, but they didn't. 
and we're like, hey, and a lot of times it wasn't through their agent, it wasn't through manager, it was them directly saying, yeah, let me spend a few hours with the upcoming creator. I want to do that. Like in the next couple of weeks, we're announcing all these industry people are coming in, senior people at TikTok, Snapchat, just like, yeah, we're going to give back. And to me, that's the really cool thing that they literally are thinking about as a way to give back. When you have become successful, you think about how can I help the people who were like me, who didn't have any connection to anything. Mm-hmm. And the great thing is, again, like I said, it's community chosen, right? It's the community coming together. And, say, and I think the people we're going to stack are going to be incredibly diverse. I mean, people who stories will resonate with the community as a whole. And that's what we're looking forward to, right? I, we still don't know who they are yet, but we're excited to see. Uh, I'm a big fan of reading biographies. And yeah. it seems like there's a similar storyline to each of these presidents or, you know, these people who have, like, John, Ro- John D. Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, where they've, you know, been taken under the wing of a mentor built this massive thing that's changed the world but then the last phase always does seem to be teaching turning around and like doing that same thing so the more we can do that the better like I, i think if you look at okay this is what the most successful people in the world have done in their last leg of of life yeah why can't we start doing that now yeah you know why wait till later let's go ahead and teach now let's mentor now yeah and uh and help the next generation as much as we can yeah and it's it's happened in a variety of industries i think it's happening again in the creator economy we just wanted a little bit more folk in the last by using blockchain i think we could just almost have a public record of it in a lot of more interesting ways but i've seen it happen again and again in various industries i've seen it happen in my founder journey and you know a lot of when I talk about this program that was so impactful in my life by Combinator, I think I haven't seen that in a creator economy yet. And so part of it is like, hey, if you could build Y Combinator from scratch just for the creator economy, you'd probably do it with a DAO because there's structural advantage that almost in bake that kind of reward system. And mm-hmm. so that's how we look at it. It's, it's something, and to your point, yeah, this is what people do later in career. Can we get people to inspire to do it a little bit earlier? Would be amazing. The amount of, of entrepreneurs or people with this mindset to change the world and start something that you've been around yeah. kind of makes me take a back, like to step back and just I'm kind of in awe of it because you've been, you've seen it from all different angles, both being a founder, being around the Y Combinator crowd where yeah. your peers are founders, investing in founders, being yeah. a, t- a Y Combinator TA. Yeah. What's, to what's yeah. the, um, I imagine there's probably some overlap to what we were saying earlier, but those who have made it and those who haven't, and maybe not even those who have made it, but those who are still on like the, the, the worthy path, if you will, or like haven't lost heart. What, what is the commonality between these founders? It's interesting. (laughs) Having interact with a lot of founders, there's some basic level that they all have. Like they're all incredibly driven. They're all, amazing salespeople, mm. right? Like, and it's interesting when I say salespeople, I mean a variety, like as a founder, you're constantly selling in some way, either recruiting talent, you're selling customers, you're selling ideas. It's tough to say when a founder transitions and, and, and for every founder it's different, right? There's a found, like sometimes a founder doesn't even feel secure when they're running a billion dollar company, right? Like they, they still haven't feel like they made mm. it. So I, I can't actually figure out what, is the tipping point that I, I don't have the data there, but I have seen like almost every founder I know is generous in their own way, mm. even if they haven't made it. Like it's just a nature and, and maybe it's a very Silicon Valley thing that we all know, you know, you could be the next biggest company, it could collapse. We've seen that again and again where companies a billion and could go to zero. It happens all the time. And also that person that you talk to who just started a company and you're like, you, you don't treat with respect, could the next day come and be running a billion dollar company. That, that, kind of behavior I think also inspires people to all be a little bit nicer to each other mm. so I do see I do think I see an immense generosity I don't know if there's an exact moment in time where I've seen a commonality when they switch from like hey you know I'm I'm successful it's all about mentorship now but I will say even the earliest of founders who haven't made it yet I, I've been surprised by their generosity that happened to me for the first time there's really? this guy who I've known for 10 years and I was talking, I remember distinctly talking to him at a wedding. He was like, he's like, yeah, I own like a restaurant, 
but I just started this software company and uh, I'm pretty excited about it. And then fast forward to two months ago, they just got a, a term sheet at over a billion dollars. I was like, wow. what? <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, but uh, it's it's kind of fun. That's the effect of time and like yeah. the just you know how things I, unfold and compound. It's funny. I, like I find myself, especially g- because our firm invests in seed companies, I was the one giving advice. And two or three years out, and like now that I'm starting a company, I look up to these guys because they've started building our companies. And it's really weird that it, it happens so much quicker than you think. I'll be on a call with somebody and they'll be asking me for advice. I'll be giving advice. Three years later, I'll be one another call mm. like, wait, you run a multi hundred million dollar company or a billion dollar company. I'm starting my next company. Can you give me advice? And and again, it, it's really cool. They reciprocate, but it's really cool. Like it's it's way faster than people think that transition happens. If you could distill down the advice that you've most often been asked to give, can you think of three different points of like, hey, I get asked this question all the time, and here's my answer? You're putting me on the spot. <laughs> I, I get asked a couple questions. One, when should I start a company? And I never have an exact answer, but it's always sooner than you think. Mm. Because a lot of people... They just don't believe themselves. And, and look, every founder doesn't really know what they're doing until they jump into it and do it. And they <laughs> learn all the mistakes that they learn and they go on to it. Like almost every billionaire founder I wrote is never 100%. If you knew exactly what to do, you should just write it down a paper, give it, and just have somebody else. Nobody knows. It, it, it is like that. So people, I, as a VC, as a previous founder, of course, I get a lot. It's like, hey, when should I start coming? It's, I would say, hey, it's probably sooner than you think. Mm. You know, for a lot of people, it is, they, they, they'll they come to me and say, hey, should I wear work five or six years at Google or five or six years start. I'm like, no, you shouldn't do any of those things. You just start a company because there's nothing quite similar to that. Um, That's good. That goes for creators too, I think. Yeah. One of my favorite books is called Just Do Something. And this author talks about so many of us try to come up with the perfect plan and just like sit down and try to think through this, but you never really know until you just do something Mm -hmm. and you learn trial by fire and, actually go through the things you meet the people and it's like it, that's the most beautiful part right of the mistakes that you make the people that you uh meet it's fun that's like you learn something about yourself through that process and you're like all right am i tough enough for this <laughs> i keep failing but anyway um that yeah no you got it no i don't know if i have three but the other one i constantly give it this uh, that I have a consistent effort like I've seen this when we were building out some of the programming stuff we're doing for our creators. We looked a lot of people talking about how does somebody become famous? How, how does someone become a successful founder? And it makes sure this kind of consistency, right? Like think of how, how many videos you had to do. Not, I'm sure that took a long time and you were doing it every single week, right? Same for like, you know, whenever I talk to people who are really good at gym, it's this consistent effort. Talk to founders, it's not like, you go and you sprint and you never work out. It's just consistent, consistent. And every day you win a little bit and it compounds way faster than people think. Like I look at some of our best companies that have gone public. There's not like one week, it's insane. And then nothing happens again. <laughs> and that's it. It hit a billion. It's like, we grew 10% this week. Oh, we did it again. Yeah. And then after a while, you're like, wait, this 10% is on a million now. Now it's on 10 million. And though he's like, wait, they just add another million. And like this kind of consistently effort and it doesn't have to be massive i've seen this leads to success in in a variety of fields anything mm-hmm. from working out to s- successful companies yeah to, to i think being a creator too i think having that perspective that all right i i look up to and admire michael and he's where i want to be at some point in time too kind but <laughs> but not I, I used to when i was 20 yeah have this pressure of like why am why am i not there right now but then realizing like, hey, I I need to like walk down the path and then maybe five, 10 years from now, I'll, I'll be there. Um, but man, that's exciting. What does a guy like you do for hobbies, Michael? Right now, not too much. <laughs> <laughs> At this moment in time, we, we just had a big product launch. So we, <laughs> I, I honestly have just been working. So this is the wrong, two months <laughs> ask me. But I, I, I usually like reading, like watching TV now and then. Um, yeah, I'm trying to work out when I can get it into a travel. It. It's working well <laughs> no, for you, man. Not the last two months. <laughs> uh, what are some of the books that, what are, what are the two books that you've most recently recommended someone else read? So, Zero to One, and, and this is a book I read a long time back. And this is a Peter Thiel book about just, sorry, copies. Um, 
I had to reread it while I was doing this company because mm-hmm. there's so many lessons there I almost forgot because like, oh, I know these things. And it is an amazing primer to think about how do you build a billion dollar business? And it, it's, yeah, that's the one that got recommended to me again as I was starting this company. And I, I recommend anybody else looking to start a company. And then one of my sister's uh, favorite books, uh, A Gentleman in Moscow. Oh, yeah. I haven't read that. That's a good I one. heard about That's a good it. One. I'm recommending to you now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how can people get involved with Creator now? Yeah, I mean, look, I think if you want to be a creator, we're doing something called Launchpad, which is just a program that you know we're getting all these creators involved in to help next generation. There'll be a lot of interesting people there. But I would say one of the cool things is actually to support a creator, it doesn't take a whole lot, right? It's it's not about creator doubt. It's about the creators we support. So in the coming weeks, we're going to publish a roster of all the creators who join. And all we ask is, hey, like, subscribe, watch them. Don't worry about us. We're, we're down. We'll be fine. Like, how can you help? Like, to us, it's, it's online creators that we care about helping more. So anybody who goes, so we'll publish a roster pretty soon of all the creators that are involved in our season zero. And we ask anybody who's watching this, anybody who's interested in creator, go support them first. That's the most important thing. Mm. Well, the infrastructure that is being built out is, is pretty robust from the education standpoint. There's an yeah. academy. Yeah. Um, you also have the community portion of it as yeah. well as like the mentorship from yeah. existing creators to up and coming mm-hmm. creators. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces. The beauty of, of it <laughs> is you can all have it distilled down into this one beautiful thing called creator DAO. So, yeah. Uh, but you mentioned there there are applications, correct? There are applications. You know, it's just we got a lot of interest for it. We want to shift food. We want to make sure people are a good fit for it. We're starting off with YouTube just because the analytics are better there. and We could just do more with the YouTube API. My co-founder and I both came from Google. Um, but it really is something that we want to open up to a broader community in the long run. So we're, we're always talking to people. And we're trying to learn, too, right? Like, Let's just, we're startup. We're very early stage. Define success for Creator DAO. How do you, en- what's the brighter future that you envision that this can impact? To me, it's two things. One, we want to be the biggest DAO in the world. We want to involve as many people as possible. And the great thing about it is like, look, I, I even think if we make a difference in one or two creators, we've made a positive impact on the world. I, I think, yeah, we start off as like, hey, can we make an impact? If we can scale that up to thousands, tens of thousands, great. If our job is to start small, help a couple of creators. Because I, like, I look at some crypto projects and the goal seems to be, let's make more money. Let's see how we can pump up this token mm-hmm. so somebody becomes a bad coder. And I'm like, that mission is just not inspiring. And ultimately, it, it defeats its own purpose, right? So. Like, if your job is at the end of the day to get the token price as high as possible, somebody has to buy that token, which means somebody's a bad coder is going to be negatively impacted. And so just the end state of that is not going to lead to some positive. If you're saying, hey, our end state is to help creators, that is a force for good in the world, right? And, and the creators themselves will accomplish great things. They'll help the world in their own way, too. So I think it's, it's a way to inspire the community, but also the, create the creators who are created this way to also give back when the time comes. And it, it is one of the things that a little drop will keep compounding, right? Each creator that we help probably go help another creator. And even if they do it off platform and on some other thing, that's great. It's just helpful. There's a, a story that I've heard yeah. about starfish and the, the okay. tide rolls out and uh-huh. you know there's all these starfish on the beach and they need to be in the water. And yeah. there's this little boy that runs up and starts throwing the starfish yeah. back in the water and the parents are like, what are you doing? You can't save all these starfish. You can't make a difference like yeah, in the big different. grand scheme of things. And the, the kid says, well, it's making a difference to this one. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about, again, the creator economy is that one creator that might be impacted yeah, okay. cre- impacts his whole community, yeah, however big or small that is. So it's like this yeah. trickle down that I think is is really fun. How many hours a week are you working on this right now? <laughs> I don't even count. <laughs> just <laughs> every waking hour, whatever hour, <laughs> minus sleeping, <laughs> everything else. Oh, man. Yeah. That's fun. Uh, well, let me ask the same question about how do you define success for Michael Ma, whether it be Creator Dow 50 years from now or something beyond that? Yeah, look, I, I think I've gotten a phase in my life where I want to make an impact in the world somehow. I think Web3 blockchain happens to be an area where you have that a potential to do that, that whatever DAO you create could live way beyond me or any of the members in our first season. 
So I want to try that, but it, you know, to me, I want to give back a little bit. I want people to look back and be like, hey, Michael did something special for the world, mm. whatever that is. You know, I want to have kids. I want to be married. Those are all goals. You know. Find happiness. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. If you were going to talk to the young boy who was uh, living in that apartment, yeah, parents just moved from China, what would be the message that you would tell that person who maybe can't see the light at the end of the tunnel but knows that, you know, there there might be yeah. opportunity. What would you speak to them? You know, I, I'm, I'm glad the way I turned out, you know, I'm <laughs> like, and it's funny, like, yes, guys, far more, but I, as a kid, I never felt that way, right? You're like, this is just whatever people live. I never felt like I was small. And I, you know, I, as they probably the only thing is, uh, you know, spending more time with my mom. My mom passed away from cancer and that would be one of the few regrets I've had in life. I just didn't spend as much time as I could with her. Hmm. Is your dad still around? My dad is still around. Yeah. Do you see him much? I do. So oh, that's, that's great. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, Michael, we are honored to be a part of this journey with you. Yeah, thank you. Andrew. And, uh, I'm so excited for what creator Dow will do in the creator economy, but really in so many other aspects of people's individual lives, I think is, yeah. is where this really ends as a story. And so for those who are listening that want to learn more about Creator Dow, maybe you are a creator yourself just starting out on the journey, or maybe you are advanced in your creator uh, process and systems and you have, you, you have it figured out, you can learn more about the Creator Dow uh, with the, the link down below. But um, I would highly recommend checking it out. This is an, an infrastructure and a, a system that gets me excited uh, for for what'll happen. And so thank you for, uh, for joining us here today and thank you for having me. Yeah. Appreciate this was fun. It.